This episode of Juice Guru Radio is brought to you by Try Best, Making Healthy Living Easy, and Juice Guru Academy at juiceguruacademy.com, where you can get backstage access to everything we're doing at Juice Guru Academy. Well, welcome. Welcome to Juice Guru Radio. Discover what the magic and power of juicing can do for you. And now, your host, best-selling author of The Complete Idiot's Guide to Juice Fasting, Steve Prusak. Hello and welcome to another edition of Juice Guru Radio. I'm your host, Steve. And on today's show, we've got Joe Stepaniak, the author of and co-author of more than two dozen books on vegan cuisine, compassionate living, and health, including her latest, Low FODMAP and Vegan. We're going to hear all about that, uh, about how IBS is an issue affecting a lot of vegans and what we can do to address that right after this with Joe Stepaniak. Here's another Juice Guru approved product. Hey there, Juice Guru tribe. Here at Juice Guru, we've tried a lot of juicers. Pretty much just about every juicer on the market, in fact. But the one we've chosen as our absolute favorite for the last three years in a row has been the Try Best Slow Star. Order your own at the Juice Guru tribe discount by visiting our website at juiceguru.com. Try Best Slow Star makes healthy living easy. Get one today. Juice Guru Radio. Well, hello and welcome back to Juice Crew Radio. I'm your host, Steve Prusak. On today's show, we've got Joe Stepaniak, author and co-author of more than two dozen books on vegan cuisine, compassionate living, and health, including her latest, It's Low FODMAP and Vegan. We're going to hear all about that. This is an issue affecting a lot of people, including the people in the vegan community, and we're not hearing a lot about it. Let's welcome to the show right now, Joe Stepaniak. Hi. Well, Joe, thank you for taking time out of your life to be here. I'm such a big fan. Well, I'm a fan of yours, too, Stephen. Thank you so much for inviting me. I love your work. I've been listening, reading your books for the last, listening to your wisdom, I would say, for the last 27 years at this point. So, wow, you've been in this a long time. <laughs> to, and I want to talk about your new book, and there's so much we're going to dive into, and especially the low FODMAP. It's something my wife is dealing with, I think, and so it's really helpful in our own life. But... um Let's talk about your your journey from the beginning with the Vegan Source book and all the body of work that you've created, dozens of books through the years. How did you first get into this, you know, veganism and spreading the word about it? Well, I was one of those people who became vegetarian as a child when there was virtually no information available anywhere. There were no books, there were no organizations, and I was very much alone. So I learned on my own when I was a child how to cook and and, uh, just sort of uh, winging it. And then when I became an adult, um, I discovered just by chance veganism. There was, and I didn't even know how to pronounce it, it was so long ago and the word was just not known, the definition wasn't even really known. And um, so, again, I was sort of winging it. And once more, there was very little at that time uh, for anybody to get information about vegan cuisine and ingredients and nutrition. And so I had to do the exploring on my own. And I realized that there were other people who were in the same predicament. And so I began writing and creating recipes to address that big gap so that people didn't feel alone and they knew that they could do this. Yeah, and we have to remember, I mean, these were in the days when there was no Internet, there was no Google vegan and find recipes or anything. Like, your books, seriously, for me, they were a lifesaver. There was really nothing else out there. <laughs> it's true. It was, they were the caveman times. There were, were. there was no <laughs> there was no web. There were no um, alternative uh, non dairy milks in stores. There weren't e- There were no. There was no Whole Foods. There was nothing. Um, and really, people didn't know where to begin. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Yeah, with a lot of a lot of uh, pioneering back then. Yes, yeah, so thank you for that. Wow, it's like for me, I'm talking to a real hero, and I think of I see your name here in front of me, and I'm like, wow, like this is just you, you, you're you're just a hero of mine. So I'm really excited to talk about your new book, Low FODMAP and Vegan. Um, and this relates to irritable bowel syndrome and things like that. Now, is this something that you were enduring, and how did this come about? 
Well, I've had digestive problems pretty much my whole life. And like most people with digestive problems, you think it's it's in your head and you're embarrassed to go to a doctor. And when you do get a doctor, they tell you it's all in your head. They do tests and they say there's nothing wrong with you. And you leave feeling miserable and with nowhere to turn. And it's... Um, it was like that for me and been like that for me for years. And um, it's especially difficult being vegan and having digestive issues because, look, people think when you become vegan, all your health problems are going to disappear. And when they don't, you feel embarrassed, you feel guilty, you wonder what you're doing wrong. And everybody, if you do tell anybody, they're more than happy to tell you, well, did you try this? Did you try that? You're doing it wrong. You should do oil-free. You should do fat-free. You should do nut-free. You should do this-free. And you end up confused and depressed and miserable <laughs> and still feeling bad. So it's really it's, it's a sad situation for people who are vegan and who have digestive issues and when I came upon the low FODMAP diet, I realized that it was not geared toward vegans and that it could help vegans with IBS, but there was no real guide map for vegans. Right. I mean, and we're going to, for those new to this and, you know, FODMAP and what's that? And, you know, I, I'm, I'm a bit in the know because my wife has had some issues. And But let's talk about... You know, if someone might have issues with it, what are some, how does this manifest? Because there's different ways that we can experience digestive issues. It can manifest in different ailments and, and um, what's the word, or chronic kind of symptoms. What, what are some of the things we might be experiencing if we, there might be an issue, first of all? Well, Everybody has digestive issues at some point. You know, we all get sort of, I mean, the beans have a well-deserved reputation, uh, so people might experience gas after eating uh, vegan chili, for example. Um, and, you know, some people get occasional food poisoning, even vegans, mm -hmm. and so they might have a bout of diarrhea. I mean, these things happen um, to everybody at some point, but with people who have chronic functional, and I'll tell you what that means in just a minute, digestive issues, that is when there is a problem. And by functional, what that means is that there is no structural damage to the digestive tract. So when physicians do their typical tests, everything looks normal. And that's the frustrating part. People with IBS have an ongoing chronic problem, and that problem may not be the same day-to-day -day or even hour-to-hour, -hour, and that's a really um, sort of uh, confounding aspect of irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, you can have pain that can come and go. You can have bloating and cramping that can come and go. You can have feeling of fullness that can happen very quickly when you're eating a meal. You may have lack of appetite throughout the day. You might need to have smaller meals in order to obtain your nutrition. Uh, generally, there's uh, a change in bowel habits, not a sudden change, but that can happen with serious illnesses, but a day-to-day -day change. You might have ongoing chronic diarrhea. You might have ongoing chronic constipation. You might have uh, both. They might be intermittent. You might have intermittent diarrhea and then followed by uh, constipation and back and forth, uh, which is known as IBS uh, mixed or unspecified. Um, mm. So there are all of these ongoing problems. It's not just something that happens, oh, you know, a couple times a year. It's generally chronic. So, you know, experiencing these symptoms and being vegan and thinking that, wow, I have this healthy diet, why is this happening? How did you stumble upon or start using the low FODMAP? And can we define that and how that is 
Because it, it's typically not a vegan diet, the, the FODMAP. Um, I don't know if we call it a way of living, the FODMAP, or, or just that it, it it's a list of things that you have to leave out. Right. Um, well, let's see. The word you used, stumbled upon, was exactly right. I stumbled upon it because people mm. with IBS are, were chronically looking constantly for solutions. What can I try to make myself feel better? And most of us have tried almost everything. I know I have. And it, it's really frustrating. So when you come across something that sounds like it has possibilities, you want to latch onto it and give it a try. And that's what I did with the low FODMAP diet. I came across this and realized and discovered that it has a scientific foundation. And the the word FODMAP stands for fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, uh, monosaccharides, let me get the right, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. And these are short-chain carbohydrates that are difficult for most people to digest. But for people with irritable bowel syndrome, they're extremely difficult to digest. So the idea is that when you embark on a low FODMAP diet, it's not a a lifestyle per se, but it is um, a transition to determine what your specific triggers are because everybody with IBS doesn't have the same triggers. These groups of of, uh, foods, there are virtually all plant-based foods that have these uh, short-chain carbohydrates that can be problematic to digest, mm. um, and that's the problem. Animal products, I mean, just like animal products contain cholesterol and plant-based products do not, plant-based products contain FODMAPs and animal products do not. And that's why there is a bigger challenge for people who are vegan and have IBS and who want to ha- try a low FODMAP diet it, it's more difficult. Right, I can um, imagine. Yeah. <laughs> so the idea is to, to eliminate these large groups of foods initially, and then uh, gradually, after a period of time, which can be four to eight weeks, gradually and systematically add certain foods back to see how they affect you. And then you know certain foods you can't have at all. Certain foods you might be able to have a little bit of. And certain foods may not bother you at all, even though they might bother somebody else with IBS. Mm. So when you went on this journey and started implementing this, what, so what kind of results did you have? And was it a lot of improvement? And how are you doing today with it? <laughs> well, um, I use the diet in conjunction with other therapies, and there are other things, many other things that people with IBS can try, but Mm -hmm. you want to use the diet. I mean, it's actually very helpful, although it seems restrictive. What happens when you have IBS is that you feel literally, and just like the subtitle of the book, you can't eat anything. The subtitle of the book is what to eat when you can't eat anything, and Truthfully, that is how people with IBS feel because when you put, especially when you're vegan, when you put certain foods in your mouth and you swallow and you suddenly feel horrible, you feel that you can't eat a thing. Mm -hmm. And so you just want to live on water and air and call it a day. So when you discover what foods are lower in FODMAPs, it actually opens the door to foods that you thought you couldn't have. And so even though for somebody who doesn't have IBS and they look at the low FODMAP list and the high FODMAP list and they think, oh, my goodness, there's nothing here. You can't have so many foods you can't have. It was actually a joy for me because I found that, oh, wow, here are a bunch of foods that are safe. Oh, okay. So and then once you started eliminating and then bringing back and then, you know, seeing, you know, tuning in to seeing what effect it had on your body 
were you really able to dial it in to say, okay, I'm going to leave this out, I'm going to eat this way, and now I'm starting to feel better? I mean, you did say you combined that with other therapies, but in following this diet. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I did feel better, and it made a big difference, and it was in- incredibly helpful. The low FODMAP diet isn't a cure. It doesn't get rid of IBS. But the, the aim is to help pinpoint triggers and reduce symptoms. And although you'll still have symptoms and you'll still have good days and bad days, the idea is to try to have more good days than bad days and to know what will set you off. When, um, and so it has been very helpful for me. Um, but when you have a food that is higher in FODMAPs, that is a trigger it will make you feel bad probably for a day or two, maybe a little longer or shorter. But it's good to know that you, you understand what caused the symptoms and the flare-up and that it's not going to last. And when you, when you need to, you can go back to a more restricted low FODMAP diet, and when you're feeling well, you can expand your options. So it's also very flexible. Yeah, and I know the book's got some recipes in there, too, to help people you know, get started. You're listening to Joe Stepaniak here on Juice Guru Radio. She's the author of over two dozen books on vegan cuisine, compassionate living, and health. Uh, really has been spreading the word before there was even an internet to uh, dial into to find out anything. Uh, the new book, again, Low FODMAP and Vegan, we'll have a link to that under the show notes at Juice Guru Radio. If you're part of the Academy, you'll have that too under your uh, notes for this interview as well. And that's the best way to get the book, right, Joe? I know it's available at bookstores worldwide and uh, Amazon, you know, the usual suspects. Yes. Yeah. Yes, uh huh. <laughs> right, so that's the best way to get it. Do, are, do you have a website too? I don't see this under my notes. I do. Um, IBSvegan.com. Okay. IBSvegan.com. So, um, what do you want to say to vegans who don't understand what it's like to have IBS? Well, I think a lot of vegans, again, feel that. If you you don't, you won't have health problems if you do veganism right, or they'll have suggestions for people who aren't feeling well, as if telling them what to do uh, will solve the problem, or as if the person who is experiencing the the health issue hasn't done all this research, and usually. People with IBS, particularly vegans, we're pretty diligent about doing our research and understanding nutrition and health, and we've already tried all these things, and adding more fiber or not having oil or increasing this or that isn't going to make the IBS go away, and Another thing that is really difficult for people with IBS, vegans with IBS um, in particular, to deal with is that IBS is an invisible syndrome. It's an invisible condition. And so you could look at somebody and think, wow, you look healthy. You look great. And they may be in terrible pain. So when somebody says, I have IBS, understanding and empathy can go a really long way. And when you're inviting somebody over for a meal who has IBS, it's really helpful, just as it is when when, uh, non-vegans invite vegans over, to ask what you can eat, what you can prepare that won't trigger their symptoms. And to also understand that a lot of times when we get together and there are big gatherings, we're going to need to be near a bathroom even more so than the average person. Mm. Um, <laughs> so taking these things into account and trying to, you know, to ask gently what you can do to help the person feel comfortable to make sure that there's food that's safe for them uh, is, can really go a long way. Right, yeah, that's, that's um, something that a lot of people probably don't even think about. So that's really good to bring up. And 
Um, what kind of results have you had uh, getting this book into more people's hands? Are you hearing back um, on success in implementing the diet and things like that? What kind of results have you heard so far and people that you've worked with to help them to move, transition towards this way of eating and, and lifestyle? Most people report good results. For the most part, um, in general, the low FODMAP diet from all of the research that's been done improves symptoms in people diagnosed with IBS about 75% of the time. And it's suspected that in that population that it isn't helping, that they may not be following it correctly. Mm. So it really can have a, a big benefit on the way people feel. And that's what's so important. We just really want to feel better and and not feel so isolated, not feel that there's nothing for us to eat. One of the things that uh, many people don't realize is that some of the highest FODMAP foods are the, the ingredients that are in almost everything. And the top two killers for majority of people with IBS are onion and garlic. And it's almost impossible to find a prepared food that doesn't contain onion or garlic. Right. So, you know, another thing that, that people can do to help people with, uh, who are vegan with IBS feel more comfortable, especially in gatherings like a, a potluck type of situation, is to make sure that foods are labeled so that we know what's in them. It's not just about avoiding animal products at this point. It's also about avoiding trigger foods and trigger ingredients. I was going to ask the greatest challenge to being vegan and having IBS. And, I mean, this sounds like it could be the greatest challenge. Is there anything that's more challenging than you know, needing to, you know, not just eat vegan, but really beyond just leaving out the the animal products, there, you know, to really look deeper at what's in our food. What do you find to be the greatest challenge? Is anything above that? Eating out, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, you know, wanting to buy all the and try all the latest and greatest new vegan products because. So many are coming on the market, and many of them um, contain ingredients that are high in FODMAPs and triggers. And so we get excited about seeing all these new products, and then I look at ingredients and go, oh, but this one can't, you know, we can't have this one, and you know, that's disappointing. And I would love for manufacturers to become, food manufacturers to become more aware and label low FODMAP products. In Australia, there's a certification program and a a little logo on products that can be certified as being low FODMAP, but we don't have that yet in the U.S. People have been more concerned about having gluten-free foods, and those have been labeled, but FODMAPs are not yet quite... Um, in the consciousness of food manufacturers in the United States. So my hope is that that will come to pass in the relatively near future um, because not knowing, you know, having to read every label even more carefully than we vegans normally read labels it's very difficult. Mm. And sometimes there are ingredients that you don't even know. Is this high in, you know, you have to memorize the whole list. <laughs> and think, you know, is this high in FODMAPs? Is that, you know, where is it listed on the label? Is it high which uh, up on the label, which means that it's one of the top uh, ingredients. It contains, the product contains a large percentage of that item. Or is it lower on the list and might that be safe for me? It's, it's, it's a challenge. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and I would also think a lot of people are doing the gluten-free, and I've heard a lot of gluten-free and vegan, and thinking that that's going to address these issues. And are you finding, you know, those people are saying, okay, maybe maybe it's not just gluten-free, maybe I do need to look deeper at the food and, and maybe start implementing some of this 
to see if that makes a bigger difference? Yes. Sometimes people feel better on a gluten-free diet when they have IBS, but it isn't because of the gluten. Actually, gluten itself is a low FODMAP food. So seitan, as long as it doesn't have high FODMAP seasonings in it, is actually a low FODMAP food. But wheat bread is not. And that's because of the, the FODMAPs in the bread, the, which is a, it's a high-carbohydrate food, whereas seitan is the pure protein in the wheat. So it doesn't contain the carbohydrate. So that's a big difference, and that can be confusing for people. But when people eliminate gluten, then they're eliminating all gluten-containing foods, which may be high in FODMAPs as well, but they're also at the same time eliminating potentially low FODMAP foods and not knowing it. What would you say would make life better for vegans with IBS? I think definitely having um, a program where products are labeled um, so that we don't, that takes away all of the guesswork. To have the consciousness raised of manufacturers and um, also um, just prepared foods when you go to a store, it could be a, a vegetarian or vegan store, and they have a deli counter and everything there contains high FODMAP ingredients. So there's no, I mean, I have, I have been to, to stores, looked at packaged products, canned soup, frozen foods, salad dressings, you name it. Everything has garlic and onion, everything. It's a challenge to find something that doesn't, unless it's a, not a, you know, a sweet food. But um, it's a really cha- a challenge to find some, anything that, that doesn't contain those items. And then for vegans, you know, one of the, the most popular ingredients today um, are cashews uh, for alternative uh, vegan cheeses, um, dates for people who don't want to have uh, sweet um, sugars. Uh, they want to have more natural sugars. Um, so the ingredients, avocados, mushrooms, these are all high in FODMAPs, different FODMAPs, but FODMAPs nonetheless. And for people for whom these are triggers, they're in everything. And they're popular foods because they're healthy and delicious and satisfying, but they're not good for people who have IBS. Um, so finding more alternatives that are used more frequently than these common foods would be great. Um, And I'd love for uh, manufacturers and recipe developers to think about uh, people with IBS and people who need to follow a low FODMAP diet when they're developing their products and recipes. One of the the big things uh, that I found is that spices are very difficult. Spice blends are very difficult to find without garlic and onion in them. And so I've got quite a few of those options, delicious options, in the book and many recipes that are very easy to prepare that people can use as staples and will keep in the refrigerator and that they can turn to over and over again with lots of variations so they don't have to get tired of them um, just to keep life easy because when you're not feeling well, you don't feel like cooking and food is just very unappealing, and, but you have to eat. Mm. And so in large part, I created these recipes in the book. There are over 100 recipes for people who are feeling bad and need to feel better. And I wanted things to be simple so that when you don't feel like going into the kitchen and making anything, you can do something, whip something up pretty quickly and easily and do so with handy ingredients, nothing too exotic, so that you can 
feel better and sat and feel satisfied without triggering your symptoms. If you're in the Juice Guru Academy, you can go ahead and type in a question there in the box, and we'll get that answered for you. We have a few people in there that might want. And if you're listening to the interview on Juice Guru Radio and you've got a question, you can always contact us at support at juiceguru.com. Be sure to get back to you. Uh, so it's just really interesting. I mean, that's one thing we should really drive home, the idea that the food could taste good, Joe, right? I mean, you look at the restrict restriction list, and that can be really scary, Right. <laughs> it can. And that's why um, uh, the book is titled What to Eat When You Can't Eat Anything, because you really can eat some things when you feel like you can't. And they can be tasty and delicious and um, appealing, and appealing even to people who don't have IBS. So if you have other people in your household, you can make recipes from the book that everybody will enjoy, and that will be safe for you if you have IBS. Um, and also, um, I do occasionally post recipes on my website, ibsvegan.com. So that's another place to um, check out for further information and updates and the latest scientific news. But absolutely, the, the book was intended to um, provide information, give support, just like the website, and uh, give guidance for what to cook when you just don't know what you can make. Well, you're always uh, up to new things, and so uh, before we close out, Joe, did you have um, what? Do you, what are your plans for the future? Any other new projects or you know ways that you can get the book out and get the message out? What do you have going on? Um. Well, mainly my mission is to. Um, Keep the rest the um, website up to date and keep adding new information and new things uh, for people who visit. I have a blog that I post with updates pretty much every other week, so I'll provide information that is news in terms of what's happening in research or um, information that will hopefully spark conversation give people new techniques and um, therapies to try and also new recipes to try. So the website's really uh, my focus and Mm -hmm. um, along with the book that um, I try to keep updated too. So when future reprints come out, they'll have the latest information in them as well. But... um, those are the, that, right now, that's my main focus. No, that sounds like it'll keep you busy. We did have one question come in here. I see uh, someone wanted to know, what exactly is on the restricted list for FODMAP? <laughs> that's that's a pretty well, lengthy list, isn't it? That It's huge. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. It's huge. So um. you mentioned the biggies. <laughs> you know, we know the garlic and onion. Um but and there were some of the fruit, the avocado, and the uh, dates you were mentioning. Stone fruits, um, so that covers uh, a lot right there. Um, there are. It, it's sort of easier to say what is okay. Um, <laughs> I would uh, <laughs> legumes, except for um, canned lentils. Uh, you can have a half a cup of canned lentils that are well rinsed. Uh, you can have that at a sitting or a quarter cup of canned chickpeas that have been well rinsed. Um, so those are okay serving sizes. Um, geez, there's uh, pistachios is another nut that is uh, high in FODMAPs. Um, I do have a pretty complete list on the website, Mm -hmm. but I have a thorough list in the book. So check both places. Uh, Get the book so that you always have that handy, and then also look on ibsvegan.com, and you'll see a more complete list um, in the book, but you'll see a pretty good list on the website as well. So it really goes over everything there. And also, it's important to know that even certain foods, it's not like you have to cut everything out. Um, there are certain foods that may not be a trigger for you that are high in FODMAPs, but um, there may be a small portion of those that you can have. So it's not just about 
eliminating certain foods, but it's also regulating portion size. It's Joe Stepaniak, the new book again, Low FODMAP and Vegan. Joe, thank you so much for the incredible body of work, and thank you for being here on the show today. It was really, you know, (laughs) eye-opening. Oh, thank you so much, Steve. I appreciate it. Appreciate you. (laughs) Thank you. Joe Stepaniak right here on Juice Crew Radio. I'm your host, Steve Prusak, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Juice Guru Radio. Find out more about us at juiceguru.com. Until next time, get your juice on.